Salinity is called the silent killer in agricultural production and natural resources management. Salinity adversely affects 48 million acres of cropland in the United States. As more and more cropland falls victim to salinization, our ability to feed our growing population is affected. Salinity is becoming a non-reversible condition on our nation's lands. Salinity also contributes to desertification. Selenium in soil and water and other toxic ingredients present in saline seeps are increasingly costly to farmers. In the United States, almost a quarter of irrigated lands exhibit some degree of salinization, resulting in significant crop losses. As salinity increases in water supplies, it drives up the cost of maintaining good water supplies. In the Colorado River Basin of the western United States alone, costs of damages from dissolved salts exceed $300 million each year. Even areas that can afford to remove, reduce, or dispose of salts in the water supply find their costs are significant. We travel to two areas where salinity is a major problem, the Big Sky Country of western Montana and the Imperial and Coachella Valleys of California. In both areas, unique methods are being used to combat salinity and reclaim land that was formerly lost to salinity. In Montana, NRCS is working closely with the Montana Salinity Control Association to assist farmers with salinity problems on their land. On the Ryan Larson wheat and alfalfa farm in Great Falls, a CRP contract with NRCS provides for alfalfa and wheatgrass seeding. These are planted in the recharge area to use soil moisture and reduce salinity development. We used 50% alfalfa, which is more than you can use in most CRP mixes in Montana. You can only use 20%, but due to the um, alfalfa using the, the, being deep-rooted and using more water, we, can, we have proven that we can use alfalfa to treat the saline seep re, at recharge area. So we can put 50% alfalfa in. We use 25% tall wheatgrass, and the remainder of the percentage of the mix was pubescent and intermediate wheatgrass. But on the recharge area, um, salt tolerant grasses. The one, most of the ones we use in Teton County have been the tall wheatgrass, the pubescent wheatgra wheatgrass, and the intermediate wheatgrass. And why are you using the higher amounts of alfalfa on the CP recharge areas? Because alfalfa is a deep rooted perennial and it can go as deep, the roots can go as deep as 20 feet in some places. In this area it's only going to go probably six to eight feet but that is where our water level is at that we need to be utilizing in order to treat the discharge areas. So the alfalfa, because it's deep-rooted, can extract more excess water out of the soil versus the grass, which are shallower-rooted. That's correct. correct. Producers in Teton County have, have clipped it. They've, they've hayed it. They've grazed it. That is a very common practice. A lot of the CRP in Teton County, though, does not have fence or water, so it is oftentimes hayed if, if emergency haying is made available. Do you know the extent of this recharge area that we're standing on right now? Approximately four sections. Four sections of land is yes. the recharge area that feeds one discharge area. Yes. That's immense. Yes, it's it huge. Right <laughs> so it's not just a 10-acre recharge area with a one-acre discharge. No. So this is huge acreages. That's right, and it's very common along the Teton Ridge on both the north and south side that you'll have huge recharge areas. Yeah. What happens if they don't treat enough of the recharge area? You won't see a significant impact on the discharge area. So the discharge area will remain if they don't treat enough Correct. of the recharge area. Right? Correct. So what does that mean, that they have to seed four sections of land? No. Grass or? No, we came with a significant amount of the recharge area, which is usually anywhere from 60 to 80 percent that we said had to be treated. We prefer to treat all of it, and we've worked with some of the producers that in, in this area to, if they didn't want to put it all in CRP, then we worked with them to work towards a flex cropping. My name is Ryan Larson and we acquired this land in 2000 and when we bought it this was about a 10 acre discharge area and really thin stubble from the previous landowners crop before above here. So we went to the NRCS to kind of see what kind of soil types we had and we found that we had a very shallow soil up there with bedrock very close to the top and we in our visit with them we found that there was a a grant called the Teton River watershed grant and they were looking for landowners to participate in a program to try to dry up some of the saline seep on the south side of the Teton Ridge 
We're in the center of Ryan Larson's 10-acre saline seep, which has a recharge area of 2,500 acres. Scott Brown, soil scientist, is demonstrating the use of a drill rig to identify groundwater location. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to drill a groundwater monitoring well with a mobile B31 drill rig that uses a solid stem augers. And we drill down, and it's what we're really looking for is the depth of groundwater. And along with that, we'll get um, depth of bedrock, soil type. And once we have the well case, we can get uh, water quality tests, and we can uh, determine what the water quality is there. Tell us how many wells that you drill approximately for a specific area. Well, in any particular area, you need them in triangles to get groundwater flow direction, and it depends on the topography. If it's fairly homogeneous, you can spread them out quite a bit. Um, if the geology and the bedrock is different, you have to have them tighter. But for an example, in an area that's maybe 160 acres, you'd put in four to five groundwater monitoring wells. And then when you monitor the depth of groundwater, how does that help you determine the underground flow of the water? Okay, we'll use the... Um, process called triangulation to determine the groundwater flow direction and so we'll survey all the wells for surface elevation and we measure down to the water table and subtract that from the surface elevation so we come up with a so to speak a topo map of the groundwater table and from there you can determine flow direction. Six-foot drill sections are added as they reach each corresponding depth. Once the hole is drilled to the groundwater table, then the PVC pipe is installed to the depth of the water table. Bentonite sealer is used to seal the well casing. What we did here is we drilled this well about 18 feet and um, we hit the groundwater at about 15 feet and as you can see the water level has come up to about one foot down below ground surface and, and if there's more hydraulic head behind us this well could flow uh, out the top of the casing. So we put bentonite around the outside of the casing to keep that from flowing up out of there. We hit um, the Colorado shale, which is the bedrock unit out here, it's an old marine shale, it's full of salt. We hit that just underneath the water table. So we hit the water table at about 15 and it was about 17 feet down, we hit that Colorado shale. And that's the impermeable layer that's holding the water table up. And from here we're going to drill a series of these wells throughout this landowner's land and from that we'll be able to map the groundwater flow direction and see where the water's coming from and that way we can identify where to put our um, alfalfa, change the cropping system, and eliminate the recharge area. Ryan also tackled some additional fields with smaller recharge areas with recropping. In this area we had a little further down to bedrock and it was quite a bit better soil. So we decided to try a recropping system here to take care of a, a discharge area. We, we have a very small discharge area in this field. And we've recropped this straight for four years and this is the first year this third crop was the first year we've got a crop in the discharge area and it's seeded up real nice this fall so hopefully we'll get a decent crop in there again next fall. What type of yields are you getting here? Compared to the rest of the farm maybe 60 percent of what we would get on summer fall areas maybe. It, it started out bad but it's getting better as we keep doing this program. And what are the positive parts about using a recrop system versus a strict summer fallow when it comes to controlling the saline seep area? It's, you just can't control it in the summer follow area. It, it gets away from you. If you hit a dry year with your crop and don't produce decently, you'll, you'll wind up with a white spot. And once it gets hot like that, you can't get ahead of it.
And the, the other good thing about it is we do not have a lot of weeds here where we've, we've noticed the weeds have gone down compared to right next door. So the offset is you get a little bit less yield, but you get better control of your saline seed because it's utilizing the excess water. Exactly. So there's a payoff. Exactly. And probably it should be cropped maybe 80% of the time to let it catch up a little bit because there's some of this stuff that's pretty hilly and you don't get anything in a dry year, but we'll figure that out as we go. So as is typical in some of the discharge areas in Montana, weeds are indicative of excess wet spots. And this particular weed is called foxtail barley or squirrel tail, some people call it. And also we've got kochia. And in really wet spots and where the ground is concentrated, the salts have concentrated, these may be some of the only plants that grow so you can identify where a saline discharge might be. So part of the way that we identify where it discharges is by identifying the vegetation that grows in a particular spot. And if this is all that's growing, it's pretty indicative that there's excess water and excess salts. And then there's some vegetation that grows. This tall grassy plant is alkali or uh, saline resistant, salt resistant. And that might be some of the only decent grasses that are growing in those areas. Otherwise, you can't grow crops very well unless there's been excess wet years and in, in years like the last five years when it's been extremely dry these areas proliferate themselves and they evaporate the water. Teton County farmer Mike Lewinstra has numerous saline seeps on his farm and has used CRP for significant benefits including wildlife. Uh, tell us a little bit about the salinization process that you've had occurring on your place and your production, describe your production system that you had previous to treating the salinization? Well, it's basically a crop fallow system where you're cropping every other year and you build up excess moisture. You would cultivate half of it and then the previous land that you colored the year the year before you'd plant to save up enough moisture to, uh, to sustain a crop. And with that you would get these saline areas that would build up. And there must be an impermeable area there that would pond up underneath there. And, and all the salts that were brought down from the hill as the soil moves, water moves through the soil, bring it there and it would, it would, uh, it would basically evaporate out and bring the salts to the surface, causing problems where you couldn't raise a crop and, and uh, weed problems. It's, it's a long-term deal. It, it uh, use sacrifices with it, but but it's worth it. It's and I've I've uh, been a good steward of the land by doing that. By having the grasses and a, and a big block of area that that are, aren't. Uh, aren't being farmed, you, you're able to have upland game bird and, and deer are able to lay out there without being disturbed and raise their young and, and uh, it's, it's been great for wildlife. I, uh, I have uh, people hunt this all the time during the fall and people come back yearly to do it and they, they call me a month ahead of time, can I come out to your place and hunt? And I says, yeah, sure. And yeah, it's been great for that. Here the plant Salicornia rubra has spread throughout this saline seed. It is one of the most salt tolerant plants that exists in saline conditions. It is a halophyte and survives in 36,000 parts per million in total salts. It is a strong indicator of salinity. There are two million acres of saline seeps in the Great Plains region of the United States. A large percentage of those saline seeps directly affect Montana. Through the efforts of the Montana Soil and Water Conservation Districts, they established the Montana Salinity Control Association. Jane Holzer is the program's director. The Montana Salinity Control Association is a satellite of the conservation districts in Montana. It was organized in 1980 to utilize all the research and um, information that had been collected in the prior decade. 
Yeah, our program is set up to work on a site-by-site -site basis with individual landowners or on a watershed basis and uh, we've done that since 1980 and we've worked on um, thousands of saline seep acres and developed them using mostly USDA programs to implement the conservation plans. So, so you're primarily interested in delineating recharge in order to treat re discharge? Yes, the saline seep which you can see is driving along is actually a symptom of the problem and it is not effective to try to treat that. So we uh, long ago learned that draining the saline area is not effective and in fact it's against the law in Montana. We need to protect our water quality. So our um, approach is to work with the individual landowner to identify the area that is the recharge area. We do that with a shallow groundwater investigation, installing shallow monitoring wells and then determine groundwater flow. And from that we can delineate which areas are actually um, contributing water to the saline seep and what areas are not uh, important to the reclamation. Well, the site we're standing on right here, how were you involved in this particular, this particular landowner's uh, resource issue? Well, actually this is called the Teton Ridge and we have worked on the Teton Ridge with individual landowners since 1980. And um, we worked with Ryan Larson starting in, in 2000, but I, interestingly enough, we worked with his grandfather um, many, many years ago when he worked with the old Soil Conservation Service and implemented some practices at that time. Uh, recently, Ryan has taken over the management of the farm and, and he was interested in reclaiming the saline land that he owned plus some new land that he had just bought. So um, that's how we got involved with him. Then how did you, uh just to try to tie this all together, how did NRCS and your and your agency work together to, to solve this resource issue? Well, the individual actually usually contacts us through the local field office with NRCS, and that planner um, will fill out a application for assistance, and then we uh, contact the landowner, and we do an initial review of the site, and from that we can determine whether or not it's something that we probably can help him with, or maybe using old aerial photos, we realize that it might be a residual problem, and so from that then we can decide whether a groundwater investigation is important. So your primary emphasis is on man-made cause? That's right. Um, the saline seeps that we deal with in Montana are what we call recently developed, primarily since the 1950s when the crop fallow system became even more and more efficient. So we're dealing with land that was not saline prior to uh, breaking it out of native range. And so um, the practices that we use um, reclaim saline areas that uh, what at one time were very productive cropland. I see. So uh, what is the cost to the landowner to use your services? Our program is partially funded by the state of Montana and from but they also mandate that we charge the landowners a user fee so it's a, um, a fee to the landowner for the monitoring wells and the groundwater investigation so the it generally costs a, a minimum of a thousand and it could be up to three thousand dollars depending on how large an area we're investigating. So is there a cost per well then to that landowner or is it, or is it per investigation? It depends on the site. Um, and generally it's per uh, acre investigated. Um, through the uh, Environmental Quality Incentive Program there is cost share for the groundwater investigation and then the identified recharge area is also given um, uh, there's a best management practice to rotate the area that has been identified as recharge area and there's a payment in lieu of um, the grain crops that they're basically giving up to rotate what is really their better cropland in the recharge area to a perennial forage. And in the conservation reserve program there's a special practice where um, that identified recharge areas can also be enrolled through the continuous sign-up program, but there's no cost share for that practice through CRP, so the landowner bears all of that cost. I see. However, doesn't it usually behoove the, the landowner to use some type of a ground um, 
investigation service to determine recharge? Well, it's the most effective way, uh, and it, it's the most intense. And then the thing that we like about the monitoring wells is that in addition to identifying the recharge area, it's a good way to measure change. And so as they rotate the recharge area to uh, perennial forage, it begins to utilize the, all the annual precipitation. So no more is going into the system. And also, the uh, generally use alfalfa, but it can be any of the uh, deeper rooted perennial grasses and alfalfa or other legumes that utilize all the moisture and then they use the um, deep rooted soil profile moisture. So the groundwater gradually drops, and then within the um, saline seep, the water table begins to drop. We're fortunate in Montana in that the uh, chemistry of the salts are such that they, it doesn't destroy the structure or the, of the soil. So it's very soluble and the salts move up and down with the groundwater table. So, so your, your company also or your agency also provides assistance with monitoring later on? Well actually uh, it's very unique because the monitoring well uh, become the property. They are the, owned by the landowner. And so while we are uh, very involved in a follow-up and keeping track of what the project is, it's really the landowner's responsibility to measure the monitoring wells on a routine basis f after we do the investigation. And it's that then that we can um, go back and look and see uh, not only visually has the salt disappeared and are, are we able to grow something in the saline sea, but where's the water table? And long term it tells the people whether or not they can rotate out back to a cereal grain, which is what they primarily grow here, or um, in which they most of the time they can. And so then it may be 10 to 15 to 20 years, but those monitoring wells are in place and then they start to see when that water table might come up and when they might need to go back and re-seed um, um, the perennial forage in the recharge area. So your ultimate goal then is to affect change in the discharge area. Right, that's the area that um, is actually causing the um, economic impact to the landowner and it's also the land that creates the um, degradation to the surface and the groundwater quality. A little bit about your salinity problems and how you dealt with them. Uh, we've uh, had to attack the whole situation from several different angles and they've taken several years. Uh, the main thing, I guess, is uh, analyzing the problem you have, getting the monitoring wells and knowing what, what your situation is, what soils you've got. Uh, under here, there's a gravel layer that goes up and down. Uh, if it gets close to the surface, I've got a saline spot that uh, it's real hard to control that. Uh, and then it'll dip way down and it'll be gone. Uh, we've got both irrigation problems and dry, uh, dry land salinity problems. They come in the, in both in the same place. Uh, it comes, there's water, groundwater higher than the canal. So it's sometimes it's blamed on a canal and it's not always the canal. The canal doesn't, but then there's a gravel layer under the canal that can contribute, the canal can tri contribute to it also. So you compound things and uh, one of the things I've done, we've closed, well clear from what, three miles over in the main canal, we would run the water out of that into a pump and then the wastewater would run down down the coulee. I've personally closed, I think, uh, what they figure, about three miles of ditch uh, by putting in flooded suctions right direct from the canal to the pump. Uh, I've saved in one project, I saved over a million gallons a day of water, of irrigation water, which is quite a bit. Uh, keep changing it around, putting in uh, buried main line, changing from flooded to sprinklers, and then I've gone from uh, the wheel lines to uh, a couple pivots now, and it, it, that's all helped. 
uh, even the wheel lines. Being more, efe- more effective, more efficient. More efficient. Uh, uh, and so you've got low pressure lines here. Yeah. Uh, I had a big, right, just a little ways down the field here. When I had uh, wheel lines, I would change them twice a day. And we even had, uh, came out and we analyzed them and I nozzled down. Uh, when I would get through the one low spot, it would start ponding up and then running. And, it, uh, and then I got a wet spot down below. Uh-huh. Uh, now, after two years of the pivot, that has, it's a fourth of what it was, and um, that's all seeded into grass, so it's not a problem anymore. I don't have any water running out of the field from the pivot. You actually had water running out of the field from the pivot before. At time, with the wheel lines, yeah. yeah. And flooding, yeah, we used to have water running all over. Uh, you had to have your wastewater you'd run it across the field when it was to the end uh, that's when it was done and you'd move to a different spot but then that it would run out to sure. different places so uh, yeah there's a tremendous difference the cut bank you see behind me is an er- has been eroded by the Marias River that's below the interstate over here. We're at a location on the Marias River between Conrad and Shelby, Montana. I'd like to draw your attention to the color change up here where you see the dark gray underlying the light tan or the buff colored uh, deposits. This is typical of the ge- geology in much of the glacial triangle major wheat growing area of Montana in that We have glacial till, which is the light buff colored deposits overlying the dark gray material, which is Colorado shale. In this case, it's the Marias River formation uh, of the Cretaceous age. The Cretaceous, all these Cretaceous deposits were uh, laid down by inland seas during the Cretaceous period. As such, they contain very high quantities of all types of salts, including nitrates, sulfates, sodium, uh, calcium, and magnesium. The glacial, uh, after these, the Cretaceous deposits were laid down, glaciers came down, and back and forth they worked the Cretaceous up, so there are lots of salts contained within the glacial till as well. In terms of dryland salinity, Normally, when we have native range or uh, annual vegetative cover, we see that those salts are retained in the upper part of the profile in the uh, soils. However, when we see vegetative cover removed, such as crop, in the crop fallow system of farming, then all the, most of the precipitation that falls then goes below the root zone and is not used by any plants, and so the hydraulic head is then raised and the concomitant pressure in the uh, underlying materials causes an upward gradient in low-lying areas and there you've got saline seep development. There are really two, uh, two processes going on here. The first one is the fact that we've got naturally occurring salts that are present already from the Cretaceous age deposition and the subsequent reworking by glacial till like the glaciers. The second is agricultural practices that exacerbate the salt transport processes through crop fallow systems. And when those transport processes become initiated, that's when we see the salts moving below the profile and causing uh, extensive crop loss and a loss of productive acres due to dryland salinity. Because of the concentration and variety in the salts we uh, have encountered in these uh, shallow deposits and in the Cretaceous deposits, it can become difficult to uh, determine the difference between uh, fertilizer, uh, wastewater uh, contamination because of uh, because th- many of the salts that are contained in these deposits uh, are nutri- nutrients in and of themselves. We see very high levels of naturally occurring nitrates, uh, some phosphorus, uh, a lot of sulfate, a lot of sodium. And so uh, 
when these uh, salts then are transported to waterways through groundwater surface water interaction, we can see uh, uh, the waterways then can become eutrophic because of increased nutrient uh, influx simply from geologic sources. So Marvin, tell us the background of saline seeps in Montana and the Northern Great Plains, and when it became apparent. Well, uh, actually we got started a, a large number of landowners uh, down south of Fort Benton on the Highwood Bench. Uh, we're losing uh, massive acreages of land on their, uh, on their farms. And so uh, a number of agencies were called in to investigate and evaluate the problem, look at it. And that's where we kind of got started with the salinity research in Montana. And there was really uh, three of us uh, here from uh, Agriculture Research Service in uh, MSU and then Montana Tech, Bureau of Mines and Geology. And we worked together on that. So the Highwood Bench was really kind of the starting place on there. And the Soil Conservation Service at that time, which now at NRCS, also helped with the drilling rig and that to get us started in the local DC uh, there helped as well. And we've kind of identified the problem there and started working on it, kind of come up with a solution. Uh, we thought that uh, we were getting excess moisture moved down through the soil profile and uh, was perching on the, the shale down below. So we drilled a number of wells there and kind of actually a lot of wells there and uh, uh, identified the problem and kind of uh, asked the landowners if they would consider doing away with uh, summer fallow. And that was uh, uh, really quite a serious uh, change of life for them. But uh, they had already lost about 20% of their land and uh, it, it was real and they were really concerned so they tried that and uh, and we also tried some deep rooted uh, legumes there which was the alfalfa and uh, they got started and uh, uh, within seven years there six years uh, our research site which was over 20 percent salt was back into 100% production. Uh, in North America, and especially in the Great Plains, when did dryland salinity start being recognized? Well, uh, right after uh, landowners up there, it was shortly after the uh, World War II and the uh, late 40s, but uh, they really started noticing the first seeps uh, in the early 50s to mid 50s. and. Uh, they called it then North Slope Alkali. They t tended to uh, uh, first see it on the North Slopes there. And that was primarily because uh, the geology dips to the Northeast, and so that was the first occurrence in the groundwater. This coulee in the background here is typical of uh, hundreds of coulees across the, the Northern Great Plains here. And the dark gray material there is the uh, Colorado, what we call the Colorado Shale. It covers uh, literally thousands of square miles here in the, in the Triangle area and on up into Canada. And overlying it is about anywhere from 30, in this case about 50 foot of uh, glacial till and drift that's covered the area. And this whole region is an extensive uh, uh, grain growing region, one of the best in the world. And, uh, and this particular site, it just kind of shows the process of cropland up on top and it's moving down through this glacial till profile. And uh, ground, the excess water that moves through the profile perches on top of the Colorado shale here and leaks out into the coulees. And you can see down here in this coulee is one example of uh, where the bank is starting to slough off here. And uh, so like serious bank erosion as long as, as well as water quality. Uh, the Montana Salinity Control Association it, it measured the salinity here. It's about 40,000 told these all solids. That's a little more saline than seawater that's coming out here. And this is typical of hundreds of coolies here on there. In this particular area, uh, they are irrigating on top, but most of this region 
uh, throughout the northern plains is all dry land agriculture. Very little irrigation. Uh, this is uh, one exception here, but uh, it's mostly uh, dry land. So is the water that gets put on the irrigated part, is that already salty or is that actually? No, no, water? that's very fresh water. Uh, typically, I think uh, salinity control said about 400 TDS. So we're going from 400 to 40,000. Till till uh, typically has about 10% uh, salt, soluble salt in it, and it's derived. The glacial till in turn, in turn, is derived from the Colorado Shale below. When the ice sheets came down across here from Canada, uh, here it incorporated a lot of the material of the underlying bedrock, and that's where the salt comes from. As you go across Montana. Uh, we get into other formations and there's less salt, but the Colorado Shale, which dominates this whole region, is the main salt-bearing uh, uh, formation. We're a headwater state here, so it drains into, in this case, into some of the other tributaries here, uh, the teton Marias River area, which in turn drains into the Missouri River which goes to the Gulf of Mexico. And, and the Missouri is used for all types of pur purposes all the way down, whether it's wildlife, public water supplies, irrigation, whatever. So uh, there's serious consequences on water quality. As well as here, there's serious land loss. Uh, in this case, it's mainly coolies, but in other cases, it's breaking out on the land surface. And, and some of our research sites, uh, Rick, we've uh, you could lose typically up to 20, 30 percent of the, all the land can be lost uh, there. However, uh, changing farming systems and so forth and working closely with the landowners, we've uh, been able to reverse that and get 100 percent reclamation by just changing farming systems, essentially doing away with summer fallow. That's the culprit, the big culprit. But any land use practice that uh, encourages and allows excess moisture to move down through the profile. One example of uh, actually non-farming is over at uh, Haver, Montana. Uh, there is at the shopping center. They built a big asphalt pad out over uh, one of the till banks there. And uh, then they piled all the snow there and it ran down through the cracks in the asphalt in the parking lot. And it's sloughing into the Milk River drainage there and now it's within about 50 feet of the back end of the mall and just one bank after another or one slices dumping in the coolie. So uh, here again, it's same process, excess moisture moving down through that profile, building up on the shale below and then coming out to surface and, and creating landslides and sloughs. So Marvin, in back of us you have a salinized area as you can see. Um, tell us a little bit about how that got to be a problem yeah. and, and what we're looking at. Well, uh, when you look a little further away from, you see the, all uh, the grazing ground there, in there, and so you think, well, Jesus, the seeps are coming out on grazing uh, pasture land. But when you look a little further, a little, uh, back up onto the slopes there, you see all of the, the cropping uh, grain, summer fallow systems and that excess moisture again the same process moving down through the profile hitting the shale below and it's breaking out right at the till shale contact there in these drainages and then once it breaks out there then it uh, builds and grows and uh, moves down drainage and and this is probably a good example here is uh, essentially unless the landowner hauls the water in there's no drinking water for the horses here or cattle, the cattle that's just in won't there. Drink it. They won't drink it. They, they're typically they get used to it uh, and they know it's very saline so they won't drink. They'll di actually just thirst to death. Now if the landowner would bring in some cattle like from the Midwest or Chicago or where is uh, uh, frequently they, they're ignorant and they don't know and they'll run right down to the reservoir or the little pothole and drink it. and. And several instances I have seen, uh, they've dropped over dead within 100 yards after drinking it. it uh, and it's typically the story is, I lost my prize bull. Well, that's what they bought at Chicago or Omaha to bring here. And, and uh, of course, uh, they just didn't know. And, 
and then up out of Shelby, I was at one site, and and they turned the bulls loose there, and they ran down to the reservoir and drank, and, and he was on a horse, the landowner, and he ran after him, and all five bulls were dead within 200 yards of the reservoir before he could get there on that to show the this stuff is lethal. Uh, the first thing that we have to deal with is, is that uh, we have water breaking out that, that's actually uh, will kill our cattle, kill our livestock, and so we have to control some of that water just to make sure that we can graze that, that ground effectively. Well, uh, as far as the TMDLs go in uh, Northern Glaciated uh, Great Plains and, and in Montana, is uh, that the majority of the water quality impairments that have triggered TMDLs in this area are because of uh, increased salinity, sediments, and nutrients. Now, this drainage behind us is a good example of uh, how groundwater contaminated uh, salinity, uh, contaminated with salinity, is reaching a stream dis discharge channel and it's on its way to the Marias River as it stands. The Marias River is currently undergoing a, a TMDL development. And so it's, uh, it illustrates how wrong-headed it would be, in this case, to look only in the stream channel for mitigation techniques. For instance, if we tried to prevent uh, slumpage or sediment increases by uh, planting riparian vegetation or putting some straw bales in or other or revetments, it wouldn't work because the ultimate source of the sloughing and sediment increase is due to upland activities such as crop fallow, uh, uh, ag uh, land use. So the ultimately the best practice for improving surface water quality in, especially in, the, in the many thousands of intermittent streams that are tributaries to our perennial streams is to reduce crop fallow and thereby prevent salt transport to uh, stream channels. It is possible to uh, uh, quantify the salt loads to stream channels and, uh, and express them as, as mass loading rates if you've got sufficient uh, water quality data for the groundwater. So if a area is designated as having a TMDL or it's designated as being impaired, then what's the next step? Well, typically the next step is to uh, do a source assessment and try to find out where the ultimate sources are. Generally in the uh, 303D list, they'll, they'll list a, a variety of sources like agricultural, uh, mining related, uh, etc. But to date, there has been uh, very little uh, emphasis placed on uh, what do you monitor? Do you monitor the groundwater coming into the stream channel? Do you monitor the isolated pools and puddles that are full of uh, evapoconcentrated groundwater? Uh, and in terms of uh, determining whether it's impaired, whether it's meeting uh, the determined beneficial uses or not, or whether mitigation activities are successful, it's important to realize that any sample from that stream channel, especially if it's in a, if it's in a, in a dry, drier stage where you've got isolated pools and puddles, is not going to be representative of either the surface water or of the groundwater. When we stop and think about it a minute, most of the uh, semi-arid Great Plains have an evaporation rate in excess of 40 inches per year, yet the precipitation rate may only be 11 to 13 inches per year. That triggers uh, a net uh, loss of moisture in the system and a net concentration of salts in any low-lying area, such as a stream channel, which essentially act as groundwater discharge areas. One of the things that Canadians have done is very similar to what's been done uh, over the over the years with soil surveying and of course it, during soil surveying uh, the surveyors uh, pick up on on the salinity that's in the uh, soil and the subsoil and try to make some assessment as to how widespread it is how severe the salinity is 
and eventually how it might affect the cro uh, crop production. Um, my main work has been on the effect of salinity, root zone salinity on crop production. However, I have been involved with the assessment component uh, that soil surveyors have tried to m use to map salinity and, and its effects. So you've developed a model that uses different criteria to effectively say that this is at risk, or this land is at risk, and how does that work exactly? Well, the, uh, there's two forms to the model. One is a detailed uh, uh, physical process model that is sort of the basis for the more applied model, which uh, then takes factors that are uh, related and produced by the physical-based models and put them into a more applied model, which identifies uh, climatic factors, soil factors, uh, crop, uh, different crops, uh, whether they're annuals, perennials, and, uh, and then topography, that is the uh, geomorphology and lay of the land, because these are all factors with respect to how uh, a particular parcel of land uh, will be at risk for salinization unless good land management and land use practices are used. And then with this model, how might somebody use the model to effectively treat salinization? Well, it identifies uh, lands and fields, particularly from an ag agricultural point of view, uh, which uh, one has to be very careful on, on the uh, way in which it is cropped, uh, minimize uh, summer fallow, for example, in, the, in, uh, in our Canadian area, which uh, is, uh, is being addressed uh, with the direct seeding techniques and uh, recropping techniques, but at the same time identifying where salinization hazards are very large uh, uh, to the point where only perennial, perennial vegetation should be uh, used in order to produce a, a crop. So by having this model somebody could say that this site might be more at risk than another, they can do some different practices to prevent salinization from occurring in the first place. That's the main objective, that's right. So this is mainly a prevention tool as you described. Um, the, the, uh, it can also identify where maybe uh, the white crusting is showing and then sort of indicate whether this will likely spread and become worse under the current land use practice or whether um, it is going to be very localized and, and can be approached differently. Okay. Uh, it's a tool in the hands of the landowner. It's one of those tools that might be used by the producer, might be used by an NRCS office to help a producer plan where the different practices might be incorporated. It's an, it's an ideal uh, uh, way in which uh, technical people can interact with uh, the land user for the benefit of uh, everyone, including the downstream users of, of the water resources that emanate from these uplands. From the, the millimoles, from their soil tests, what levels are, should they already be concerned? What they should be doing is uh, investigating the, the newer lists, crop lists, which identify the, the uh, levels at which the, the salinity will affect their crop at the lower end and certainly uh, we know now that uh, some crops and some cultivars of, of uh, crops will, will uh, show losses at, say, two decisiemens per meter of saturated soil paste extracts or even less, um, maybe one and a half even, uh, depending on the crop. But at the same time, what these crop lists can do is identify those crops which have less, uh, have more tolerance and less sensitive to salinity, such as canola, for example, we're discovering 
has a tolerance about equal to that of, of most barley cultivars. And these, these uh, allow then the, the landowner and, and farmer to, to change between crops in order to address the grassy weeds on one side or the broadleaf weeds on the other side. And all the rest of the related pests. Exactly. Agriculture represents a significant portion of the economy in California, especially irrigated agriculture. Agriculture's impact on California is huge. In fact, if California were not a part of the United States, it would be considered the fourth largest economy in the world. California currently has 1.3 million acres of severely impacted saline and sodic soils. The number of acres of impacted land is growing by 7% per year. In the Coachella Valley in Southern California, NRCS District Conservationist Sam Aslan discusses the local agricultural economy. In Coachella Valley, salinities uh, could range from uh, ECs of uh, 150 to uh, 1. And uh, we have various ranges of uh, ECs. So what we plan to do is, is find out what the, what the farmer is going to grow and then survey the field, try to modify the salinity, leach it, change the chemistry of the soil and the soil quality so that particular farmer could grow the crop that he needs to grow. Coachella Valley uh, produces about $340 million uh, worth of uh, agriculture uh, produce. And uh, the salinity can be devastating at times, depending on the field. We could lose 10% of our production up to 90%, or, or it could be a total failure. Depend, depends on how good of a job uh, they do uh, uh, during reclamation. Uh, reclamation process deals with uh, possibly uh, slip plowing. Uh, it deals with uh, drainage uh, installation. It deals with uh, how they leach and how much amendment they put. Uh, we like to see them uh, use uh, sprinklers to leach because it's easier to handle. They can move the sprinklers rather than flood. Uh, we could be a lot more efficient uh, in leaching. So it, it all depends on uh, how much of an attention the farmer pays, uh, pays to his uh, reclamation, how he does it, how efficient he, is, uh, he does the uh, reclamation process. It all uh, turns into dollars at the end. Are you all doing a lot of tile drainage to facilitate the desalinization? Yes, uh, tile drainage is necessary uh, part of the equation. Uh, without a drainage, uh, as, uh, as you may know, uh, we can't reclaim the field. That's a necessary part. That's correct. What about tailwater recovery pits? Or we do have, we do use those in some fields. Uh, most of our fields are uh, uh, the water delivery is it's all underground. This is one of the world largest underground delivery system. It covers about sixty thousand acres. It's all gravity. It's all piped to the fields, so we have no open ditches. Uh, so we 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 have very little tailwater is what I'm getting at. We're very efficient. Uh, we're probably one of the most efficient systems uh, uh, that are around here. Any one time uh, we have, uh, we could have over 100 different types of crops. Uh, we have herbs, uh, winter vegetables, uh, you know, broccoli, all kinds of peppers, jalapenos, uh, bell peppers, yellow peppers, green peppers, red ones, <laughs> all sorts of different vegetables and fruits, uh, table grapes, uh, dates. Uh, we're, the, we're the most uh, major uh, date producing region in, in the United States. Uh, so there, there are all kinds of activity here all the time. In addition to our crops, we have 150 golf courses uh, within 20 mile radius, 
uh, that covers, uh, we feel there's about 50,000 acres of irrigated turf here. Uh, salinity problem could happen on, in golf courses. It depends on what kind of soil they, they were built on. And uh, we do go out to golf courses on occasion. The process is the same. Uh, we drive the tractor, gather the data, produce the map. And uh, this is mostly done on, the, on uh, greens. Um, we, our golf course industry is, is very important to uh, Coachella Valley. Out of the se total 70,000 acres that uh, we uh, irrigate, there's about 40,000 acres uh, that has tile drainage. And it's all a closed system. Most of our tile drains are installed at six feet, in six feet depth. Uh, they're approximately, on the average, 150 feet apart. And what it does, our tile lines work as taking the, uh, when we leach, they take the excess water and the salt, drain it in the salt and sea. What about water reuse? Do y'all reuse any of that water? We don't use uh, tile drain. Once it's drained, it, the, the water goes into the sea. Basically, that's a fresh water that we're put, putting into the sea. So we do not uh, reuse this water uh, at this time because uh, we need to augment uh, the, the, the sea. So there's no mixing of fresh and saline waters in any? No. Aslan also discussed the use of the electromagnetic gamma ray meter, the EM38, used to measure salinity and its role in conservation planning in the Coachella Valley. We do a lot of uh, electromagnetic field sensor surveys. Uh, to do that, uh, we take thousands of readings out in the field. And uh, one of the main reasons we do this is because of uh, better uh, precision uh, farming and uh, salinity control. What we used to do about 20 years ago, we used to carry this EM probe up and down the field by hand, uh, set it down, take the readings. Well, since, since then, as you can see, the unit is mobilized. Uh, we can drive the unit up and down, get a map for this particular field, and we know exactly how, how we need to leach this particular field. Uh, whether we, we're going to leach half of it, 25% of it, or we're going to leach the whole thing. As you can see, this saves us a lot of time and water and amendments. It saves the farmer, believe it or not, thousands of dollars uh, because precision farming is, is, is the thing now. The rig you see behind me is one of the Salindi Laboratory's second generation salt sniffers. We built this particular rig back in 1999, and it's designed to do two things. It can do EM surveys and soil sampling. The EM38 meter that you see is carried in the back on a tail sled, and when you're doing an EM survey, that will be deployed on the ground, and the driver will be driving it back and forth across the field. That EM data is logged up into a data logger in the front that merges it with a GPS unit and GPS data and the driver has complete control over how that data is collected and when it's turned on and off. When they're done with the survey and they download the data, they can use the EM data to decide where to soil sample. At that point, this rig can go back into the field and the soil sampler on the front then becomes the primary unit and they drive back to specific locations and collect soil cores. So the rig is designed to serve both purposes. Right now what we wanted to do was run through a demonstration of how you calibrate an EM38. And basically this is done in three steps where we're first going to put the unit on the ground and null out the in-phase component. Then we'll raise it into the air and get the two to one ratio for the conductivity reading. That's sometimes called the quad phase component. And finally we'll put it back down on the ground and check that the in-phase is still nulled out once those three steps are completed, the unit is ready to be taken out in the field and used. So here we're going to do the first step, which is nulling out the end phase on the ground. If you read the geonics manual, they'll tell you to null out the end phase in both the vertical and the horizontal mold. But normally, 
because that slows the survey down so much, we just null it out in one mode and we usually do the vertical. So after your instrument's been turned on and warmed up, you would bring it down on the ground, switch to the IP phase, and dial in a reading of zero in the vertical mode. I'm doing that here right now and have just gotten a zero reading. At this point now, we'll switch back to the QP phase and raise the unit up to calibrate it. In step two, what we're trying to do is achieve a two to one reading. We want the vertical reading, when the instrument is orientated in the vertical mode, to be twice as high as the horizontal reading when you've had the instrument on its side. So to do this, you raise it up at least five feet into the air. Here you can see I'm using a little PVC stand to help me hold the instrument so that my arm doesn't get tired. Anyway, you get it up at least five feet in the air, put it into the QP mode, and check your readings. If you don't have a two to one ratio, then at this point you would adjust the QP dial and start changing the reading until you get a two to one ratio. Here I approximately have a two to one ratio on the dial already, so this instrument is in calibration. In our final step, we bring the instrument back down on the ground, put it back into the IP mode in the vertical position, and check to see that it still reads zero, plus or minus two millisiemens. Here I'm getting a reading of minus one millisiemen, so this is still fine. We would still consider this to be nulled out. And at this point, you can consider the EM38 calibrated and ready to be taken out into the field. So if you're doing a hand survey, you can start your survey process now. Or if you're doing a mechanized survey, at this point you would take the EM38 and go put it into your tail sled. One very important thing to remember when you're doing an EM survey is to be consistent with where you take the measurements. Uh, for example, we're out here in a, in a bed furrow environment, and say I was going to go out into this field and, and do a grid survey, walk this field, I want to take my EM readings in the same location with respect to the bed furrow each time. So I could choose to take them here up on the top of the bed or perhaps I would want to take them here down in the furrow but I would always want to be consistent with the measurements. And when you first get out to look at your field that you're going to survey you want to appraise these sorts of these sorts of situations and figure out where you're going to be taking your readings and always make sure you take them in the same location. The first thing I do is I contact the grower or whomever in charge of that field, get permission, and I go out there the day before I'm going to do the survey. I dig potholes anywhere from 6 inches down to 18 inches, and I check for moisture. And I need to have at least 50% field capacity uh, in the soil. That way I, uh, the readings will be very reliable. I'll pick up, if any salinity is down there, it'll, it'll be picked up by the, by the signal being sent down into the soil. Once I do that, I go out there the next day if the field uh, has enough moisture in it and I set the rig up just like it is in the background and I determine if I'm going to go 30, 40, 60 foot or some kind of a measurement in between the runs. At the beginning, at the end of each run, I turn the data logger off so that we don't record any unnecessary data. As I turn around and start the run again, I turn the data logger on. The data logger is the one that's recording the information that the EM is picking up out of the soil and that's being logged in the uh, TDC-1. Uh, that's the GPS uh, uh, data logger that we have. The production of dates as a crop occurs only in California in this country because of the state's unique climate, soils, and water quality. In the Coachella Valley, the use of the EM38 technology is extremely important for helping farmers produce healthy dates. When we first uh, we surveyed this field with the EM technology, this was the 80 acre field. We found out that the center portion of this field was uh, extremely salty, around 120 decisiemens per meter. And our suggestion was, of course, uh, to reclaim it first uh, before they went ahead and planted date palms over here. And uh, obviously, they didn't take their time uh, in reclamation. Sometimes this does happen. When uh, folks have a lot of money, they get in a hurry. So uh, they did plant date palms, and in this particular field, 
uh, date palms, the uh, offshoots failed because of the high salinity. They, they, they didn't only fail once, but this was, uh, this was planted twice, and it's failed twice. So our suggestion was to plant uh, ornamental uh, palms because they're a lot more salt tolerant. As you can see the results, uh, ornamental palms are doing real well. In the portions of the field that are less saline, date palms are doing real well. As you can see the field behind me over here, it's the date, date palms look very uniform. Uh, reclamation process has taken place here. Uh, soil uh, is adequately treated. Uh, ECs that we're facing over here right now is right around four decisiemens per meter from uh, initially it was 120 decisiemens. And there's a reclamation process has to take place. Initially what we're looking at is uh, land leveling, uh, breaking up the compaction and the stratification of the soil uh, which we face with in Coachella Valley that usually requires a slip plowing uh, down to uh, five feet deep and installation of uh, tile drainage. Normally it takes about two seasons of cover cropping. Uh, we're looking at summer season, uh, possibly uh, cow peas, Sudan grass, and winter season we're looking at some kind of a clover uh, with barley. Now, we're thinking if we can grow two seasons of cover crop with uh, cover crops not only provide a lot of biomass but they also uh, provide a lot of CO2 into the uh, ground uh, which becomes carbonic acid aids in the process of uh, reclamation. In addition to uh, land leveling and all other uh, cultural practices that we do uh, we're also looking at application of on the average 10 tons of gypsum per acre before uh, you can get any kind of a reclamation going. So normally we do all those things. Sometimes in a field like this you're looking at 10 to 20 acre feet of water per acre to get the salinity levels to where you want. Well, my job is to explain the results of the salinity survey and explain it in non-technical terms to the farmer. So, um, what I'll, first thing I'll do is I'll compare the salinity map with the soil map from the soil survey of the Coachella Valley. And usually what you'll find is in uh, coarse sandy soils like this, it'll have less salinity than say a fine Clay so the equipment that made this survey is very sophisticated electronic equipment. So my first job is to explain in non-technical terms to the farmer what the results of the salinity survey mean. What we found in this field is um, very low salinity throughout the whole field. We have one little hot spot right in this area right here. Probably not, to, not enough significance of salinity problem to do extra salinity management with. and. Um, but in general, the field looks actually very uniform crop growth throughout. What if it, uh, what if I had some areas that I had some higher salinity areas? What would be some of your recommendations? Say it was 20 decisiemens. 20 decisiemens? Yeah. Well, where would you start with that process to try to clean the that area? The ECE, where you're going to have a lot of yield reduction on uh, peppers, is probably around 4 four decisiemens per meter. So we will try to, the plan would be to get it down to four decisiemens. Yeah, in general, in soil. Um, leaching irrigation is what's necessary to uh, reduce the salinity levels. In general, in the Coachella Valley, um, one foot of, uh, one acre foot of water will reduce the salinity by half. So you said that your your field had 20 decisiemens. Mm -hmm. Okay, to drop it to 10 decisiemens, we're gonna need to add one acre foot of water. To drop it from 10 to 5 decisiemens, we're going to need to apply it either through sprinklers or contour basin leaching. Whatever type of leaching method you're using, we need to apply another acre foot of water. So now, let's see, we started at 20, now with 10, now to 5, and that took 3 acre feet of water. So to get down into the range for peppers, which is about 4 decisiemens per meter, um, we're going to have to 
put on a, probably another acre foot of water. So now we went 20, 10, five, two and a half. That'd be the minimum you could go. So it took four acre feet of leaching irrigation to drop your salinity from 20 to, to four, to four, less well, than four. In those situations, are there any times where you would add gypsum or sulfur or sulfur pellets to soil amendments? Chemicals? Soil amendments, especially if there's high sodium in the soil, will help the displace the sodium ions off the soil and replace it with calcium ions from either the the gypsum or actually as the sulfur reacts with calcium in the soil it'll actually make a gypsum and the calcium will replace the sodium. How do you decipher whether there's a sodium problem, a sodic problem, or a general salinity problem? Um, usually that takes extra laboratory tests for gypsum requirement okay. to determine what the actual level of sodium. This is just giving you a general conductivity as the name is says electromagnetic conductivity meter. So it just gives you a general idea of the conductivity like electricity in your soil. And so other lab tests need to be run to determine how much sodium needs to be replaced. With the uh, What would be the the benefits of going with an irrigation system, a sprinkler irrigation for leaching versus a flood irrigation, which is a standard process, uh, irrigation system. That uh, well, in. sprinkler irrigation is, is, is much more controlled irrigation than uh, flood irrigation. Um, flood irrigation requires a lot of uh, land leveling, and whereas sprinklers is a much more controlled situation for leaching irrigation. Now, I think you asked me also about leaching during irrigation, and that will also help the salinity, but not bringing it down from a 20 to a 4. But there has to be also some leaching during irrigation. So the irrigation system, the sprinkler, would be a point of contact to go after that specific higher saline area. Yeah, I, th I think it's an ideal situation, especially on a coarse sandy soil like we see here. Um, this is not a good ground for flood irrigation leaching. It's, it's kind of difficult. There's a lot of slope. And, uh, and the success of these stories where you're trying to get those fields back into a, an excellent crop production, are you looking at six months, three years, five years? Can you give us a, a time frame, say, pick out an example well, of 20 decisemens? How, I would say at, at least two seasons, one or two seasons for a 20 decisemen field, probably have to grow cover crops and um, probably have to use quite a bit of amendments on the field. And then, of course, you need to do more electromagnetic uh, salinity surveys. Well, this is the uh, Imperial Irrigation District's salinity assessment vehicle. And uh, we lovingly call it the Salty Dog. Um, just a little nickname, but it's kind of catchy and it's good for PR. We uh, are providing a salinity assessment of individual farm fields for the farmers. Uh, we do not charge for this service, but we do use the EM38 uh, technology that was developed at the salinity lab in Riverside. And uh, uh, basically go out to the field and, and uh, at the request of the farmer and do a salinity survey of his fields. Uh, we can map the variability of the salinity around the field uh, by driving back and forth across it. Um, on board I've got a laptop computer that acts as a data logger and then also a guidance system uh, because we're tied in with a uh, differentially corrected GPS that's mounted in, in the rig. And um, uh, so it gives me a moving map in real time that I can uh, see where I'm at in the field, uh, monitor the GPS as well as the EM38. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, once I've collected all of the electronic data uh, from the survey, then I process the data using uh, the Salinity Labs ESAP software. and. Uh, develop a sample plan where I go back out to the field, um, 
using the GPS to guide me and I go back to 12 specific places in the field and uh, take ground truthing soil samples that are run through the laboratory um, that then we we later correlate and merge the data together to make the, the salinity maps that the farmers see. Salinity, as we have seen in this training program, is a problem affecting millions of acres of land in this country. It can be a persistent, stubborn problem that takes the right conservation techniques applied at the right time to reduce or eliminate saline seeps and the effects of salinity on the land. The staff of the George E. Brown Salinity Laboratory in Riverside, California, are dedicated to research on the diagnosis of saline and sodic soils. Here, a staff of 40, led by Dr. Don Suarez, works on the development of reclamation techniques and determination of the salt tolerance of a wide variety of crops and ornamental plants. The laboratory has been a leader in the development of assessment tools for rapid mapping of salinity in the field. Laboratory staff have developed computer models for predicting water flow and solute transport and evaluating water quality criteria for irrigation. Dr. Suarez says the present mission of the laboratory is to conduct research on problems associated with crop production on salt-affected soils and the degradation of surface and groundwater resources by salts, pesticides, and pathogens. The Salinity Laboratory was established in 1937 by an act of Congress. Subsequently, in 1995, we moved into our new facility uh, here on the UCR campus and we're now the George E. Brown Jr. Salinity Lab. The lab is comprised of three research groups dealing with salinity, uh, physics, plants, and chemistry units. And historically, we've looked at topics such as water quality, suitability for irrigation, reclamation of saline sodic soils, plant salt tolerance, mechanisms of salt tolerance, We've established the world's database on uh, salt tolerance of plants. We've also looked at water flow and the effects of soils on hydraulic properties, some fundamental properties of, of water flow and salt movement as well. More recently, the lab has expanded the research program into new areas. Uh, we now have a program on uh, animal waste that is looking at the um, impact of uh, microorganisms and their transport uh, from feedlot and dairy operations. We also have a pesticide research program looking at alternatives to methyl bromide. And we've also expanded our research uh, in salinity into areas of uh, toxic elements associated with, with salinity. So 
We examine the transport of selenium, arsenic, boron, and we also now look at specific ion effects relating to plant growth and ion ratios and ion balances, interactions with uh, nutrients, uh, with water stress, salinity water stress, salinity nutrient stress. In this experiment, uh, this is funded by the Environmental Protection Agency. We're looking at the impact of water quality on infiltration rates. And th in this experiment, uh, we have different uh, SARs, different ECs. So we're looking at SAR from 0 to 10. We're looking at EC1 and 2 of uh, irrigation waters. And we're examining the interaction of the irrigation water and rain. Previous experiments on infiltration and the effect of SAR and EC have always focused on a system that only considered the irrigation water composition. What we're doing in this experiment that's unique is we're sequencing rainwater, which is distilled water, with the saline and sodic irrigation waters of different qualities. What's unique about this experiment is that we're looking at the interaction of rain as well as the irrigation water. Previous experiments on water quality suitability for irrigation have examined only the impact of the irrigation water on the infiltration rates. And in this experiment, we're looking at distilled water as the rain, and then we're looking at saline waters of various compositions being irrigated sequentially. So we do alternate uh, putting on about an inch of rain, and then the next irrigation cycle, approximately a week later, depending on water needs of the plant, then we sequence with um, the, the saline water for irrigation, and then we do another rain sequence. The rainwater again is distilled water. Uh, we've simulated uh, raindrop intensity impacts, that is the energy of rain impact, and also raindrop size uh, with this rainfall simulator. In this experiment, we're looking at the salt tolerance of peppers, two varieties of peppers, and we're also looking at the impact of different ion compositions on the plant response. As an example here, we see this is sodium chloride at 0.21, uh, 0.21 megapascals osmotic pressure. Right next to it here, we have the same salinity level, 0.21 osmotic uh, pressure, 0.21 megapascals. This is sodium sulfate and this is sodium chloride. And so we can clearly see here the effect of chloride ion toxicity on these pepper plants. This is a good illustration of uh a varietal difference in response to salinity where these plants that are grown in uh, a mixed salt uh, composition, uh, the uh, ace peppers are doing much better than the uh, Yankee Bell. Uh, here is another uh, manifestation of uh, ion toxicity. In this case, uh, the uh, excessive sodium in the irrigation waters result in a uh, uh, calcium deficiency, which is which shown here very clearly on some of the other uh, fruit uh, as a blossom end rot, a very uh, serious uh, problem with uh, various uh, uh, crops like tomatoes, uh, peppers, uh, uh, cucumbers, perhaps. We've seen in this experiment, as well as many others, that uh, a salinity uh, affects not only the total biomass of, of the crop, but the uh, fruit production as well, the fruit quality, sometimes fruit uh, color and texture are uh, affected by salinity as well.